Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, según... Good morning, good afternoon. Depending on where you are. Thank you again for joining our Pan American Climate Resilient Health Systems course. Today, we will be focusing on opportunities and guidance for lowering the carbon footprint of health systems. As usual, please remember that you can use the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. Our uh, participants will be speaking in English today. So please uh, use the interpretation. Please remember the upcoming sessions. On uh, Tuesday, we have uh, measuring, monitoring, and evaluating. Uh, that's on Thursday, sorry. Measuring, monitoring, and evaluating climate resilient health systems. Please remember that we'll, we'll be checking your attendance as you join the meeting with the link you received when you enrolled. So please use that link and do not use someone else's Zoom link. Please remember that this, this session lasts 90 minutes. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A section. Please remember you can include your questions at the Q&A section in Zoom. The sessions are recorded and posted on our website within 24 hours. Please remember that uh, you can find the links to the presentations at the end of the session. Today, we have James Ospedales. He is a founder of Earth Medic Earth Nurse. We also have Elizabeth Schenk from Environmental Stewardship Providence. We also have Fiona Miller. She's a professor of uh, health policy. And also Diana Bicon Magnari, International Climate Director, Healthcare Without Harm. So let us now begin with James Ospedales. He's a founder and managing director of Earth Medic Earth Nurse. He's a lover of nature, an accomplished public health physician, a person of faith, a father, grandfather, gardener, and a woodworker. Dr. Ospedales founded Earth Medic Earth Nurse to mobilize health professionals to urgently address the climate and health crisis. He chairs the uh, Defeat NCD Partnership Executive Committee addressing NCDs in low resource countries. He was the inaugural executive director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, leading the agency to become a recognized stakeholder in global health, weathering several public health emergencies, developing an innovative tourism and health partnership, and raising the alarm on the climate and health crisis. He was the coordinator of NCD Prevention Control in PAHO WHO. He is uh, a graduate of the University of West Indies and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's a fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health and accredited partnership broker with the Partner Institute of the UK. He has published over 100 papers and reports. So it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome him here today. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I am so happy to participate in this course on a uh, climate resilient health systems course. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and we are very close to Venezuela. I have worked with PAHO as for almost 20 years, as Irene has said. So I feel I'm at home with PAHO and South American countries. I will be speaking in English. I might use Spanish phrases. I listened to most of the talks in the series so far and um, uh, picked up a lot of good points. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and, and listen to the earlier talks of the need for climate action. Uh, it is our responsibility.
Ooh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. What happened? Uh, it seemed to cut anyway. <laughs> did you? I started in Spanish. Did that come through? Everything came through, no problem. Okay, okay, then I continue. Um, and you're still seeing the screen? No, we cannot see your screen at all. Did you try okay. share screen? Yeah, I did. Let me try again. That's important to be able to show the slides. Okay. Perfect. Okay. It's it's uh you started screen sharing and now it's loading. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I was saying I listened to the earlier parts of the series and it is a, a lot of rich knowledge uh, that that was there. Um, a lot of great points were made. I finished by talking about the importance of the role of non-governmental organizations in climate action. Um, these are the official, the formal learning objectives, uh, which has been posted in the chat. And I will achieve these objectives by sharing with you some things about the Caribbean health system and the evolution of uh, tools and thinking about reducing uh, carbon footprint of health systems. Honestly, estamos comenzando. We are beginning. We are way behind in this game. Como, como todos saben, as everybody knows, the patient Earth is sick. And there are many signs and symptoms of this sickness. Uh, including the heat, the, the storms, the rising sea levels, the, the pandemics, Sahara dust, etc. Uh, and this is leading some health professionals to take to the streets and protest, exercise their democratic right to protest and say, this is very dangerous, uh, we need to act. Let's look at a few definitions. Um, climate resilient health system one that is capable to anticipate, respond to, cope with, recover from, and adapt to climate-related shocks and stress so as to bring improvements in population health despite an unstable climate. So that's quite a challenge to do that, especially in some systems that uh, are already starved of resources and they don't have enough staff, they don't have enough funding. And there's a further to do that, it really requires dealing with the supply chain, as we will talk a little bit more about. A low carbon uh, system begins with thinking about how you build, operate, and invest in health systems that reduce the amount of greenhouse gases. Uh, and of course, the reason why uh, has also been said earlier in this course, um, the, 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 the health system produces a significant percentage of global greenhouse gases. Many countries committed to this path in the health uh, uh, section of COP26. Net zero is more uh, ambitious target for minimizing all greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the health sector's activities to essentially zero. When we account for all the sources and all the, the sinks, the things that capture the carbon th that we influence so that you balance out and you walk away with no impact. This is possible, but it requires vision and uh, uh, focus. Just to remind the different scopes of gases, one, two, and three, those that come directly from the health facility, such as running your boilers or the vehicles, those that <clears throat> scope two are those that you make indirectly, particularly electricity or energy, uh, and uh, all the emissions are scope three. And scope three is usually the big one, all the medicines, all the diagnostics that we buy in the health services. Uh, uh, scope one and two, you could do something about. Uh, scope three is often where the biggest impact is, but in order to do that, it means going, going upstream. And we heard earlier in the course, the need for us to go upstream with this problem of climate change. Let me show you a few slides for the Caribbean context and shout out all the Caribbean people I saw online from Antigua to Jamaica, Suriname. Great, great to see Caribbean brethren on, on, on the course. Uh, we live in a watery part of the world in between North and South America. 
uh, archipelago of islands of uh, 40 million is the population in 30 países uh, with four, lang four major languages, very diverse in size and level of development from Cuba, which is quite big, to tiny islands of less than 100,000 people. We have a lot of travelers and tourists every year, and there is agreement that these islands are uniquely vulnerable to climate change. But we have three big problems. Lack of access to finance based on vulnerability. It's based on per capita income, but this is not a good formula for us, given the amount of damage that happens with climate change. We have gaps in data to understand and to plan carefully, and we have a challenge of coordination across many countries and languages and, and many different donors. So it, it's a little complicated, but we have to. The University of West Indies in Jamaica has really uh, improved greatly our understanding of climate science uh, for and what it means for us in the Caribbean. And in, in, in essence, we are hotter and drier weather overall with more giant hurricanes and storms and extreme rain and flooding. This has many implications for people's health, for the economy, and for the environment. But I believe that health professionals are not sufficiently aware, and I will show you some data uh, that that is so. What are examples of this? Uh, drought in Jamaica, the whole of that upper part of the Caribbean, the Yucatan uh, at, at that time, El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, Jamaica, uh, had impacts on food and water security. And this problem, maybe you're not so familiar in Latin America, but coral bleaching on, on the, the picture on the left is the coral that is bleached and damaged from warmer, hotter, a heat wave, an ocean heat wave. And the picture on the right shows how hot some parts of the Caribbean Sea are becoming above what is normal. Then we have these monsters. Uh, a lo mismo tiempo, tres huracanes, Jose, Irma y Maria. I don't know why they only give them Latin names, uh, but we live in a, uh, for this for this set. But this was amazing. This unprecedented uh, triple hurricane, Hurricane Maria in particular, devastated Puerto Rico, devastated Dominica, uh, over two hundred percent of the gross domestic product. Uh, this is mi país, Trinidad y Tobago, uh, hace hace cuatro cinco años. Um, there was an unprecedented flood which divided the country in half. Uh, a lot of people lost their farm, their house, their home. And this has become an annual almost occurrence. Last year in November, there were terrible rains and floods. Uh, this was part of the damage as the seas uh, are not only warming, but they are rising. So that coastal erosion in many countries in the Caribbean is a serious issue. And for some countries, this is the end. Uh, 30, 40 years from now, uh, the land will be underwater in many parts of the Bahamas, many parts of Trinidad, uh, many parts of, of Guyana, Suriname, and Belize, which are very low lying. This is driving people to be displaced or migrate. Uh, a UNICEF report here documents an increase in children who are being displaced by these storms uh, from one community to another or one island to another. So it is important to make provision for this in advance. Uh, we have two problems in the Caribbean. Maybe you don't see so much in South America. Uh, one is Sahara, uh, the, the, the um, sargassum seaweed. And the satellite picture on the right shows the band of seaweed stretching from West Africa to northern South America, the Caribbean, and parts of uh, the United States, Florida. And this has been only the last 10 or 12 years. This is a new phenomenon. And it's getting worse every year with damage to fisheries and the economy. This is the second problem that uh, we experience more and more, Sahara dust. As it gets hot and dry in West Africa, uh, the, the sand blows off and it comes to the islands and also to the Southeast United States. So, it's just getting worse and worse every year. So that's what the health sector has to respond to, all those problems. 
and the economic impact, the economic basis for doing it is undermined by the, the incredible uh, impact on the economy of these uh, small islands. When your economy is very small, a major storm takes a high percentage of the GDP. And you see here of the top 10 countries based on percentage of economic loss, nine of the were, were nations in the Caribbean in the last, 10 year, last 20 years. Now, in the face of this, how does the health system become more resilient, uh, uh, safer, greener, uh, and health promoting, which is something I like. I think we should, uh, in the climate movement, champion health promoting uh, infrastructure and greening of health facilities. I think I first saw this slide maybe two years ago. And when I saw this slide, I felt shocked. And I felt embarrassed. And I felt ignorant because I did not know that we in health were such a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. It means we must uh, 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 take recognize this and begin to work to improve it. And you see here in this global study, the breakdown of the majority being around energy and energy use and all the other things that we do in the health services. Because primum non no cherry, first do no harm. The health service is not supposed to be doing harm. So once you discover something that we are doing is polluting the global commons and making heat and hurricanes and drought and, and misery and ill health worse for everybody, we have a public health moral obligation to stop doing it, to plan how we're gonna stop doing it. And in order to do that, we have to uh, know our status and, and, and begin measures to, re, to become uh, less carbon uh, uh, footprint. Here is good guidance from the WHO on measuring uh, uh, the climate resilience of health systems. And if you are familiar with the building blocks of a health system, you see on the left, uh, the things that need to be focused upon in coming up with more climate smart or climate resilient health systems. I add one more, I add the community. We need an informed and empowered community as part of the health system uh, or else we, we because together we can, we can maybe have a better chance. I use this diagram from the World Bank publication on 360 degree resilience to talk a little more about uh, the implications of climate change for a resilient health system. Uh, the ability to anticipate, to absorb, adapt, and transform is the definition here for a clim climate resilient health system. And you see, I put uh, community, I put community uh, at the at the base of everything. Uh, and in fact, community features in leadership and governance and all the building blocks. The next two slides just give some ideas of what are the examples of the implication for the health system uh, if it is to be climate resilient. First, there needs to be policy uh, that we are going in this direction. If the ministers of Mercosur and the ministers of CARICOM and the ministers of Comunidad Andina and SICA say we are going in this direction, that's a strong signal to everybody that this is a priority, like we have other priorities. Uh, maybe it's uh, Ebola or uh, containing measles or health security. This, this, is, this is it. It has implications for collaboration. It needs leadership in different levels, visible leadership. For information, we need climate smart health surveillance that links climate, environmental, health, and socioeconomic data. We need research that's context specific and tracking climate action in the health system. Very important is the climate literate health workforce. And I'll say a bit more about that in, in a moment. Uh, if we look at service delivery, then the there are implications as patterns of health and disease change. Uh, health facility resilience and greening is, is, becomes more important to increase safety and resilience and reduce the carbon footprint. And colleagues from health on the call need to realize by adding green, by adding green to safe in the health system, we actually increase the value proposition of the health sector as a contributor to reducing the carbon footprint of our country how to continue patient care during extreme events, the need for cloud-based medical records, telemedicine, et cetera. All these are implications for the health system. 
medicines, diagnostics, and vaccines. Uh, uh, the changing climate conditions are, are changing the requirements. How do you reduce your carbon footprint? Some medicines increase the risk of health illness, common medicines for high blood pressure, for uh, diabetes, and some of the psychotropics. People need to know that and as, the, as it gets hotter and hotter. And the financing, the prioritization of maintenance is very important if we're going to be more uh, resilient. Of course, the investment to retrofit. Let me talk about the knowledge action gap in the health workforce. We are sitting in this conference, and I presume everybody is quite uh, motivated to learn about this, how to improve the climate resilience uh, of, the, of the facility, of their program. This chart summarizes three knowledge attitude practice studies. Uh, one is about to be published from four or five Caribbean countries. And you see 99% of staff say, yes, we heard of climate change but 10% are reporting action in the workplace that they have solar power or rainwater harvesting, or they're doing composting or recycling. Uh, and that is a big gap. In between is a fair understanding of the main causes, but less understanding on what is the impact on health and healthcare specifically, and less understanding on what to do. Many people, about a third, perceive big barriers. They don't know enough, they don't have the tools, Nothing, anything that they do will make no difference anyhow as an individual, or they're afraid they get uh, discriminated. They will be criticized for doing this. So there's a lot of barriers. So we really need a climate education program to address this. And it's the sort of thing I'm happy to say we've been doing with, this is an example uh, with the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education and the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology to join forces with people in climate service uh, we just published in uh, Frontiers in Public Health, uh, a capacity building course, which is a landmark course for us. Uh, this was the Bahamas. I was there, I was here in December, which has 26 islands and uh, 20 airports in a country with 300,000 people located in the hurricane zone and very low lying, so a lot of risk. And the Bahamas uh, put on a great um, training workshop uh, entitled it uh, Climate and Health Ambassadors to give it a certain panache and uh, saying, let's do it together because we have to work together, the health sector and the community to become more climate resilient. We found participants significantly improve in, in their reported readiness to work on addressing health impacts of climate change suggesting that an intensive, well-designed course like this uh, could shift people's attitude to working on the problem. There is quite a bit of guidance on reducing carbon in the health system. And uh, in, 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 in the Americas, the PAHO WHO Smart Hospital Toolkit is a well-recognized one. Uh, it's, they published recently the evaluation from the Caribbean and I know that earlier in this course, uh, Judith Harvey from St. Lucia uh, gave a talk about the uh, smart hospital program that PAHO has, which includes the hospital safety index and the green checklist to uh, focus on for safety, which is important with the hurricanes and the storms, and it being green to reduce your carbon footprint. A smart health facility is defined as safe and green. Some people say safe and green and well-maintained. And I, I mentioned earlier, also health promoting. So one that is structurally and non-structurally non resilient. Uh, and also, also energy improvements are important for us. We have very expensive energy in the Caribbean. Uh, so solar panels, batteries, low consumption systems. And these could help the hospital to function during emergencies and disasters. But we have 600 hospitals maybe and health centers in the CARICOM Caribbean, maybe 50 have gone through this program. So we have a long way to go to scale up uh, this essential practice for all the countries. How to go from 50 to 500 by 2030. Here are the elements of it. I think Judith Harvey talked about this. Resilience, 
uh, being number one, that you must be safe uh, with all these elements, green, and then that leads to you being smart with less downtime, with more resilient structure and environmentally uh, less footprint and less carbon footprint. This is based on a, a training that lasts uh, two or three days the, to use this kit uh, with uh, working with PAHO WHO and it requires uh, a, a lot of preparation to for success. But I think uh, this one in the Eastern Caribbean has shown good success. WHO guidelines for climate resilient health facilities are here, uh, as Maria Nera mentions, to equip planners and facility managers and uh, those who are financing how to make the facilities more resilient uh, to reduce their environmental footprint. We, we have a responsibility to do that. I want to mention the Alliance for Transformative Action, ATASH, which started at COP26, where a lot of countries made uh, commitments on health and climate and health uh, in, in, in that uh, conference. This is thinking about net zero. This is an excellent uh, plan from the UK National Health Service. Uh, just the last few days in the UK, there's been tremendous agitation on climate and health with thousands of doctors and nurses demonstrating uh, on the street and asking for one thing. You know what they're asking? That there should be a public health education campaign on climate change. A public health campaign on climate change. That's their ask, which I think is a good one good one to think about, because from my earlier slide, I believe we really need this. In the UK uh, diagram, you see very nicely the sources and what they're trying to do with their scope one direct, their scope two indirect, which is mostly electricity, and scope three uh, in, in, indirect, which is huge, as, as you see here, from staff commuting to food and catering uh, to your, your medicines, your waste, your inhalers that we use in the health services. For us in the Caribbean, I really look at the free solar energy we have, and I think, you know, we can really make a big difference on that side. On my own home, I have, I have a, a six kilowatt system. This is from Kaiser Permanente on what, what they have managed to do with carbon neutral. I draw attention to this tool, which I came across a few months ago, Aga Khan Development uh, Health Services Network Carbon and Cost Tool. I like it. It's a one hour training. It's free. It uh, uses an Excel based uh, calculator that uses data on costs of electricity and water and so on uh, that are usually available from administration uh, of the hospital or the facility um, to make uh, cost the impact of making a change. Uh, it, it uh, generates some dashboards. I think this is a tool that it could be used by quickly by many uh, people in Latin America and the Caribbean. There really is, as I look at these different tools, there's a need for uh, perhaps a paper or a comparative analysis of the place of different tools um, and how you can uh, use them. The Alcan Network Cost Calculator is described here. Uh, here's the user's manual. Uh, there's been an expert WHO meeting which also look at it and uh, uh, supports it. Healthcare without harm uh, is big for many years, especially in the North America, aiming to reduce the environmental footprint of healthcare worldwide. And, and I like this aspect of the uh, stated mission to create community anchors for sustainability, uh, including offering free training. That community anchor for sustainability is, is important. If we imagine as in, in the Caribbean, we have primary healthcare centers throughout the community. And if healthcare centers and polyclinics become uh, models of sustainability and renewable energy, for example, that's a great example for the community. For primary healthcare offices and GP offices, two models that the uh, two sets of guidance that uh, we've been interacting with are Greener Practice UK and My Green Doctor USA. Uh, and they're also uh, free to get their materials. Let me conclude by um, pointing to a few things and then I'll expand a little bit more on one or two things. But this is a sort of summary slide of if we are to have um, serious resilience and reduction of carbon, uh, the guidance is not only what's necessary. The guidance is part of what's necessary. You need a policy. 
that forms part of the country's political agenda and has resources. Uh, it needs champions in the government and in the health authority, in the state, uh, in the hospital, and we need training and sensitization of all staff. Uh, this is not rocket science. We've done this before for other major public health problems. We make a policy, we assign leadership, we train and sensitize all the staff, we track the action, and we communicate our progress. I think research is also needed given the, the changing situation. We need to think outside of the health sector and think of how we join with climate services and community groups and environmental groups. And those vulnerable facilities or those that are scheduled for renovation may be ones to prioritize for greening efforts uh, if, if these are going on. As I mentioned during the talk, adding green to safe in the health service increases the value proposition of the health sector in the NDC. Let me say a few more words about some of these specific points and then I will be finished. Um, for the Caribbean, we've been working on uh, research for action on climate change and health in the Caribbean, which has these impact goals to reduce climate associated ill health, uh, reduce the environmental risks, increase the capacity to prevent uh, vulnerable populations and safer, more resilient health systems. Uh, these are the partners involved in this initiative, ourselves in Arithmetic, University West Indies, OPS, uh, Emory School of Public Health and the Yale School of Public Health, uh, NOAA, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, provided funding for the, the work. Um, we, have a, we have an interesting job if you're in climate and health activism because there are a lot of things to join up to become more climate resilient. Uh, we need within the health system to join together more hospital and primary care, public health, private care, and countries that have significant amount of private hospitals, how do they become climate resilient? And then the, the all of government approach between health and the rest of government, health and the community, health and the business sector, private suppliers of uh, green construction, renewable energy. We need partnerships with these, with these uh, organizations, but we have to be very careful of conflict of interest with fossil fuel companies and tobacco companies. Uh, these are almost like uh, dealing with, uh, yeah, have, having to work on that. So th th with those remarks on training and research, I, I thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, we've been looking at uh, what are the opportunities and what sort of guidance should we be following for reducing uh, carbon footprint of the health sector. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, uh, James. Um, Thank you so much, James. Now we are going to Dr. Fiona Miller, who is going to show us our first case study based on what James presenter. She's a professor of health policy in the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto in Canada. She directs the Center for Sustainable Health Systems and Cascades, a national initiative for Climate Action and Awareness in Healthcare, funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thank you, Fiona, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Irena. It's a real privilege to be here today and to follow James. Uh, I wanted to start with two context setting slides, not this one, this is just my acknowledgements, um, and particularly to the funder Environment and Climate Change Canada, which supports Cascades. But and forgive me, um, translators, I have added this slide to my deck just to pick up from where James set us up to, to understand healthcare's contribution to climate change. And I think this is an important thing to add to just reinforce what James was saying. When I got started doing this work, thinking about the climate impact of healthcare, the broader environmental harms of healthcare, I, like many people, assumed that the primary place that we needed to focus was buildings and hospitals specifically. They're large entities, they run 24 seven, they have significant energy handling requirements, they produce significant quantities of waste, 
But this is from NHS England, from their really landmark announcement in the depths of the pandemic, I think it was October 2020, when they came forward and said, we will deliver the world's first uh, net zero national health service uh, and following up from work that had been going on since 2008, we're able to really provide um, a critical insight into where the climate harms of care reside. And they reside to a very substantial extent in healthcare delivery, in clinical practices and in the products that we use. So that's one very important context for thinking about how do we reduce the climate and broader environmental harms of care. The other context that I wanted to start with was to introduce my country. And I do so both to situate my talk and also because Canada represents um, a situation that is common in the sense that we often have variable uh, state commitments to make change in the health sector. We often have diverse health systems across a jurisdiction that are not uh, unified under the authority of one actor. We often have the opportunities to leverage learnings from many different parts of a broader community to make change. So Canada exemplifies that. Canada is a federation quite decentralized, both in law and with respect to the amount of uh, fiscal capacity, so the capacity to raise money that the uh, subnational states, the provinces have, which vary enormously in size. Uh, for my own province of Ontario, almost 16 million to a tiny province of PEI, Prince Edward Island in the East Coast, and three territories um, that are in the north, one of which is the most recent uh, subnational state to become part of Canada, uh, it was broken off from the Northwest Territories in 1999, uh, in part as part of a land claims agreement. So this is a public government um, with majority um, oversight by the Inuit peoples, this uh, the Arctic peoples. And that's an, another, I think, feature that in many ways, in different ways we share, which is in Canada, a critical importance of indigenous reconciliation with the First Nations, the Mi, Métis, and the Inuit peoples um, of this country. So is this, this is the context then in which I work. So Cascades is an initiative funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada, leverages the work of three independent university centers that work with their health sector partners in British Columbia and Ontario, Ontario and in Nova Scotia, and also a national NGO uh, that has been in this space for over 20 years, the Canadian Coalition. And so we have boots on the ground in four provinces in Quebec, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and BC. And in the context of change that I, I'm talking about, which is variable state-led commitments to this, um, and a need and an opportunity to leverage expertise and capacity that is growing within the health sector, we really work with uh, three tools in our toolbox, if you will. And I think this is both what we do and relevant for others. Professional education, um, oftentimes uh, smaller than this forum, but an opportunity to uh, get folks up to speed, both in terms of fundamental knowledge uh, and more advanced knowledge that can be focused in particular clinical areas, for example, or for leaders, sorry. Another major area of activity is to really support innovators uh, who are trying to make change in their setting. Uh, and this isn't new to the world innovation. This is really in the spirit of quality improvement where we have good reason to believe that there are environmental benefits and there's clinical clarity about what this means for patients, what this means for populations. And increasingly, um, we engage with uh, pan-Canadian coordination. So really working to bring together and to leverage the expertise across uh, this very decentralized federation. But again, as I say, um, I think quite relevant to other jurisdictions where there isn't a simple and singular authority that's guiding practice change. And the context for us, and I think for all of us, James made a comment about we're really at the beginning 
And, and I would agree, we are in many ways at the beginning. So I think a useful model for change is um, this one, sort of the innovation diffusion curve, right? Where we are uh, principally on the left-hand side of that curve. There are folks that are trying to do work, trying to innovate in their setting, because even if it's known in theory what has to be done to reduce um, desflurane, change practice in anesthesia, change practices in primary care with respect to inhaler prescribing, you still need to develop the tools and resources in settings that work for that community of providers and for those patients that engage them appropriately in these conversations. And so we do a lot of work with innovators, again, really leveraging the quality improvement framework and methodology, which is both I should say a methodology, just to reinforce that. It is a methodology. There is a, a whole science of quality improvement, but it's also a mission and a vision. It's a way of articulating the value of high quality, low carbon care, where this isn't about um, reducing the quality of care. And in, uh, in many um, parts of the world, this is about improving access alongside reducing the climate and broader environmental intensity of care. So it's about improvement, um, but it's not enough to simply have individuals in certain spots figure things out. We need to spread that uh, and really get to the early adopters by, by spreading the work. And finally, ultimately, I think uh, an effective model for change is to think about scale. Now, as Cascades, we're not in a position to scale. Um, we're not in a position to support full implementation, nor does that make sense for a project to be that. So we work um, with provincial uh, for the most part. Uh, Canada's health system is largely provincially and territorially run. So there will be agencies um, surgical quality improvement agencies, quality improvement agencies more broadly um, that can oftentimes scale the work, spread it, uh, and make it consistent across a practice. And so um, our, our, our tools for change are used across this diffusion curve. And then in terms of the work that needs to be done, I would argue that there is two broad buckets of work. Um, one is to really think about the leadership piece, as James was suggesting, and the system change. And I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about a low carbon sustainable health system, that includes but goes beyond uh, low carbon sustainable and resilient facilities or low carbon sustainable and resilient hospitals. The system of care that it includes but importantly extends far beyond acute care into primary care, into community-based care, and low-carbon, sustainable, and high-quality, resilient health systems have greater primary care and community care capacity. Um, and so making sure that as we build attention and, and build skills within leaders within organizations, that they um, are not solely trying to create excellent, independent organizational entities, but organizations that are part of more comprehensive systems. We need to think about how to connect the dots. And I think I'm speaking to the choir here because folks are particularly concerned with resilience and I'm focusing to a substantial extent on mitigation, on lowering climate harms, but it is both possible and necessary to connect the dots between reducing environmental harms and, and ad adapting and improving resilience, as well as connecting to other commitments within the sector. And in Canada, for example, very important commitments to person-centered care, to integrated care, to high quality care, to um, health workforce management, meant staff that are feeling engaged, equipped, and supported. So connecting the dots between these agendas so that they're not a separate side of the desk initiative, but they are integrated within um, the issues that leaders are pursuing. And then I think a really challenging question for managers um, and leaders is how to, how to manage for transformation. I don't think we have a full picture of what this looks like, but it isn't simply minor change. 
And then as we think about the clinical practice issues we need to transform, and I'm leaving to the side infrastructure, uh, though that is important and, and relevant. But in terms of clinical, I think it's very important. Our work uh, really does focus on trying to think about care pathways. So trying to avoid looking simply at a specific device or a specific anesthetic gas or a specific facility or department or unit within a facility to the pathway of care, because again, it's across pathways of care that we can make some of the most substantial um, shifts in our practice for sustainability and resilience. So that's very academic. I apologize for, for being so sort of abstract. Let me give you a couple of examples of work that we're doing in collaboration with experts from across the country that pick up on these two areas of practice, uh, the care pathways and the leadership and system change. So Pharmacy and pharmacy practice, whether that's in hospitals, whether that's in primary care, whether that's in communities, is actually an extremely important place to make change. Oh, crap. Hi, Irina. You're telling me I'm out of time? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, you have three more minutes. I have three more minutes. Okay. Back we go. Okay, I should be good. Um, so what we're talking about here then is just briefly, um, there are issues in environmental risks um, of certain types of medications There are that can be reduced. There are more climate intensive and less climate intensive versions. There are also, as James mentioned, important issues for adaptation because some medications increase risks. Um, Deprescribing. So we know that there's overuse of medications and polypharmacy that is often causing harm, certainly using resources, creating environmental challenges. Um, there are issues in appropriate use of existing med medicines. If folks aren't using their necessary medicines well, then we're not getting the health benefits, but we are getting the environmental harms, proper disposal. So all sorts of issues that can be done there. And our work here is in the early stages. In terms of perioperative care, we all know that um, you know, the operating room is a very, very resource intensive part of a hospital, for example. Um, so there's important things that can be done within that space in terms of anesthetic gases and medical gases. Nitrous should not be a, um, a carrier gas, or certainly not in high income countries. Uh, Desflurane can be got rid of, low flow, reusable supplies and gowns, but also it is about perioperative. It is about connecting the dots between what's happening in that operating suite and prior testing and prior um, visits and appropriateness of the kinds of um, surgical care that's provided. And work that we're doing here is both sort of local and pan-Canadian and working uh, have a, working a great deal with quality improvement agencies across provinces for spread and scale. In terms of leadership, this is an area where, again, our work has been working, uh, we've been working with experts from across the country to really build and share knowledge about what kind of greenhouse gases are major organizations already estimating, what else can they do, and what is left out when we approach this from an organization by organization perspective, how are we going to get the whole system view so that we can contain and reduce the whole system's effects? And here's my final issue, which is this is really about engaging the quality improvement community in transformation. Uh, in Canada, in many parts of the world, quality improvement is both an important methodology, as I said, an important vision. It's also part of accountability frameworks. It also is a way in which healthcare organizations can be driven to make changes. And so integrating sustainability deeply into all aspects of quality improvement is an important way um, to spread and scale our efforts. So I'm gonna, uh, if we have time for this Zoom poll question, be interested to know um, how folks view the role of quality improvement in their setting. I think we should be getting the answers soon.
Okay, that's really interesting to see. So for many of you, uh, um, it is in fact a, a useful way of pursuing this. So that's great to hear. And with that, I'll thank you very much uh, for your attention and time. Muchísimas gracias, Fiona, por tu excelente thank you, Fiona, for your excellent presentation. Now let us go on to the third case study. Elizabeth Shank, she's the AVP Environmental Stewardship Providence. She serves as the Associate Vice President of Environmental Stewardship for Providence, one of the nation's largest nonprofit health systems. She leads Providence's action toward carbon negative by 2030 through strategy and innovation, conservation of resources, by improving efficiency of practices and processes, and through education and research. Built on her experience decreasing the environmental impacts of healthcare for almost 30 years. Dr. Sheng is an assistant research professor at Washington State University College of Nursing. She serves on the board of the national organization, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, the state organization, Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, and the local organization, Climate Smart Missoula. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing and is a member of their expert panel for environmental and public health. Thank you very much, Fiona, for presenting your case study. You have the floor. Thank you, Irena, and I'm so pleased to be with you all today. And it's wonderful to hear the two preceding speakers. So, Chuck, can you see my slides and hear me okay? We can hear you and see the slides. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so first, just to explain a little bit about U.S. healthcare, um, which is that um, we are a mix of private and public. It is not the same system. We're fractured across our entire uh, uh, country. So you can see that about 80% of our facilities for healthcare, this is hospitals, clinics, and systems, is private nonprofit care. Of the remaining 20%, about 10% well, those don't add up, um, uh, about 20% is um, public as well. And of the uh, private, about 20% is for-profit and 80% is nonprofit. If we look at health insurance on the right, about 67%, two thirds is private, 20% um, is public, and about 14% are uninsured. So this makes a um, mosaic, a complicated health system. So we don't have top-down um, directives. We have a lot of competition. We are um, profit motivated for some of this. And even for the nonprofits, they have to always operate on financial bases largely. Um, so this makes for a complicated approach to healthcare and a really complicated approach for changing healthcare, especially the transformation that we're talking about with decarbonization. Just as a reminder, this is what the United States looks like. These are our states. And this, these green states are the states that our system operates in. So Providence is one of the larger health systems. It's in the top 10 in terms of health systems across the United States. And we have a very broad reach. So from Alaska to Texas is, you know, like a quarter of the globe, something like that. And we serve a lot of people. So we have 120,000 employees. That's what we call caregivers. 36,000 nurses, 25,000 physicians. We um, give away through charity care and community support almost, actually this year it was over $2 billion. 52 hospitals, almost 1,000 clinics, a university, a high school, many spinoff businesses as well. So it's a very large organization serving 5 million people a year, separate, separate um, individuals. And we have made a pretty significant uh, commitment to decarbonize. So this is a picture of our president and CEO, Dr. Rod Hockman, who is a physician. And in 2020, actually on Earth Day of 2020, we announced our intentions to reduce all that we can by 2030. And this is because the scientists at that time, and still even more so, are talking about the urgency of timing, the importance of reducing emissions now. So this is about mitigation, driving down our carbon emissions. Little did we know how big the pandemic was going to be because we announced this in April of 2020. In January of 2020, one of our hospitals had the first hospitalized patient in the United States who had COVID. And then the next two years, maybe three years, were completely disrupted by the pandemic in healthcare. 
around the world and including in the United States. Nonetheless, we made progress on this issue and it's, it's important for me to remember that even during the stress of the pandemic, people were coming to us and saying, I'm so glad you're working on this. I'm so glad we're taking this on because the climate crisis is upsetting to people. And in our part of the country along the coast with fires and floods and incredible heat, uh, people are feeling it. And so that really motivates uh, people. All right, so I just wanna clarify to make sure we're all on the same page about these terms. Decarbonizing is a little bit of a buzzword right now around the world. Um, when I talk to people, they don't necessarily understand that that means greenhouse gas emissions. So just as a quick primer, Greenhouse gas emissions are those gases and chemicals that accumulate in the atmosphere that cause the heat, that are heat trapping chemicals, causing the warming. Of um, greenhouse gases, the most common and uh, present one is carbon dioxide. So that's the big bubble, 81%. There's also methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. Those are the main buckets of greenhouse gases. So what scientists do is they translate all of that to a carbon dioxide equivalent. That's what the little e is. CO2E is carbon dioxide equivalent, generally reported in metric tons. So to decarbonize is to drive down the carbon or all greenhouse gases. So that's what we're talking about. Okay, we have a quick Zoom poll question. So I will be quiet for a moment while that goes up. Wow, pretty pretty evenly distributed. Okay, well, great. Well, we're gonna talk about each of those and um, they're all important. So you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm interested in, uh, I'd love to talk to you more about why, you, why one concerns you more than another. Okay, so proceeding with slides here, just a second. So, you know, people come to us with disease, illness, needs, treatment, support, et cetera. They, they access healthcare services. Unfortunately, we create a lot of pollution, as you've heard about from our prior speakers. That then drives further disease and illness. So what I work on is disrupting that bottom connection there to decrease the pollution. And I've been doing that for a long time. I often say my first successful project was in 1993. So that's 30 years and have seen this change a lot over, the, over 30 years and especially in the past five years. This is picking up speed, getting more attention, we're galvanizing a global movement, and this is satisfying and also, you know, a little, still we're behind the eight ball. So we have not solved it, but we are getting more attention about the importance of the health impacts of climate change and healthcare's contribution. All right, so we developed a framework to address those elements you just voted on, because we think these are the big buckets of climate emissions, carbon emissions, waste, energy and water, agriculture, food, chemicals, and transportation. And also, it's really important in our messaging to 120,000 employees that this is something we do. It's something all of us need to participate in and contribute to. It's not just a small team of technocrats. And also that it requires action. It's not just a matter of thinking about it or being concerned about it. It's actually carrying out the steps to decarbonize. So I'm going to go quickly through uh, these elements. Waste is an important feature, partly because it's what everybody sees, feels, and touches. I talk about climate all the time, and usually the questions people ask me are about waste and recycling. It's not the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, disposal is not, but arguably the creation of the waste, what Fiona was mentioning about our supply chain, the purchases, the over purchases that drive the enormous quantities of waste, that is a, the most significant aspect of our carbon. So for us, we created 94 million pounds of waste last year, just at our hospitals, and um, we're tracking it closely. We have a scorecard that gives us results every single month for every single hospital. And we're thinking about it in these ways. Disposed waste is that waste that is treated, sent out of our doors and treated. 
Diverted waste is waste that we prevent from going outside of our doors for that kind of treatment and, and ensure that it has a higher use or reuse value. But avoided waste is really the big picture here. This is what we want to do, and we want to measure it. So this is a little bit different than other schemes about waste reduction. But otherwise, we can't really tell the story of how important it is to reduce the waste in the first place. Energy and water gets a lot of attention in healthcare. It's about our buildings. And it's tremendous. We we create we are incredibly energy intensive, and at our sites we uh, spend about 130 million dollars on on our energy a year. We're doing a lot. We're doing all that we can to reduce uh, to increase the efficiency for electricity and natural gas. Natural gas is a big challenge for us because we don't have a great alternative yet, and we can't just replace all of our buildings. That wouldn't be smart anyway. So we're working on detailed projects across all 52 sites to be more efficient with energy and water. Agriculture and food, we work on, on, we have three primary goals to decrease the carbon intensity of meals served because you probably know that um, agriculture is a big contributor to climate change, the methane production. Also, at least in the United States, we have a tremendous food waste problem. So we're working on that um, in several ways through our purchasing, through composting, through um, programs that help us reduce waste on the prep side, so in our kitchens, also to maintain local and sustainable foods as much as we can. And we're making some progress on that, which is really exciting. The C is for chemicals. And we used to, when I was doing this work earlier, I would think of chemicals as chemicals of concern that cause asthma, hormone disruption, miscarriages, different issues from, from hormone disrupting chemicals. And that's true. We are concerned about those and we work on those. But we're also working on the specific greenhouse gas chemicals. So those are in anesthetic agents and we've reduced ours significantly and we think we can reduce them uh, up to 90% uh, by the end of 2024, that's our goal, the greenhouse gas emissions while not, not impacting patient care at all. Um, and also nitrous oxide, which is a, has been a sleeper issue. Nitrous oxide in piped systems in the walls tends to leak. We found that about 90% of our gas leaks. So we are decommissioning that all over our hospitals uh, in, in Providence. We've also looked at our inhaled um, medications and are working on understanding that better for better recommendations to all the prescribers. It's complicated. That one is a complicated one. There's lots of moving parts to it. So that is a little bit about our, our chemicals work. And transportation is uh, a big one. And in fact, in 2018, it surpassed buildings in the United States as the sector providing the most greenhouse gas emissions. So it's the most polluting sector. So we're working on that through all of our business travel, our employee commuting, how products are delivered to us, and also the way we deliver care because we do a lot of care delivery by driving to people's homes and we need to do that, we want to do that. But we've really built up our telehealth. That was one of the benefits of the pandemic. We learned how to do that. And so we're seeing significant reductions in our emissions from care delivery, literally the delivery of care to other locations. All of this is incredibly, data-driven, and I've told you that already, that we have built this scorecard. We have a wonderful team in India. It's the Providence Global Center, and they are really tech developers and um, engineers who help us uh, in a variety of ways. And um, Irena, am I getting close? You are indeed. You have three okay, more minutes. minutes. And so um, this gives us the necessary information to make these data-driven evidence-based decisions. It's incredible, and I often say, before it, be comparing before we had this work hard to after, it's like someone turned on the light. This is just a view of our over, overall strategic plan. You can see words that you recognize, mitigation, adaptation, and advocacy. I just described to you mitigation in large part. I'm now gonna look at our adaptation work and we have another mnemonic for this and it's we reach resilience, equity, adaptation, climate, and health. We signed the um, Department of Health and Human Services pledge this year. And so in 2023, we are developing our climate resiliency planning. This impacts our buildings. We have operational challenges with the high heat and high smoke that we live with. We have clinical um, opportunities. We need to make sure clinicians understand differences that with, with specific diagnoses related to heat or smoke or flooding or mold. Um, and we have community issues as well. So we're working with our communities on environmental justice and trying to expand their lens to include climate. We're doing a lot with our clinicians. We have a newly hired or a newly uh, designated medical director of environmental stewardship in Providence, and he's been a brilliant partner 
And we were trying to reach 90,000 clinicians uh, in our own walls, which is really uh, challenging, um, but important. We work hard on communications always, and that's also difficult in our work. I'm gonna skip these two jokes, but you can look at them later. And we're on the right track. So we're making good progress. We have reduced about 11.5% so far of our emissions. And um, we are measuring it, we're, we're confident about it. And we are also participating in national and global conversations so that we can provide real world um, experience in how this works in a complex health system. So we act, we reach, and we try and uh, contribute to our vision of health for a better world. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Elizabeth. No quería. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I didn't want to rush you. I wish I had been able to see the those jokes, those um, cartoons, but I will see them later. Now we're going to the final session by Diana Picom Manjari who leads the Global Climate Program and Implementation of Healthcare Without Harm's Climate Strategy. She also oversees the team's work on national and subnational policy for climate action. For the past 20 years, she has worked with international organizations on development and public health programming. She has lived and worked in South Sudan, Thailand, Myanmar, and Ethiopia, and provided technical assistance to organizations in Western, Southern Africa, and America. Before joining Healthcare Without Harm, Diana's experience focused on monitoring, evaluation, learning, and management roles in resilience to climate change, food security, infectious diseases, and immunizations. Thank you so much for being here to share you, the final case study, and you have the floor. Thank you so much for your presentation, Irene. Oh, I am so glad to see so many people joining us from so many different corners of the world including from my brothers, sisters, and siblings uh, of South America, since I'm originally from Peru, uh, and my adopted country, the United States of America. I want to share with you today these um, a few approaches of healthcare without harm uh, to low carbon and sustainable health systems. Uh, work that we've really started many, many years ago with toxics in advocacy with um, uh, both health systems and with suppliers. Um, and that has now led us to this work around low carbon and sustainable health systems. So I will start really sharing a little bit of the story. And this story really starts about four years ago, when together with the consultant firm Arab, we published the Healthcare's Climate Footprint Report, as you see on your left. This is where the first estimate of the global net emissions from the health sector was measured and where we established that if the health healthcare sector were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter in the world. It was a great first step, but we knew that we needed more granular information to understand what different paths may countries take uh, to achieve net zero or zero emissions. In 2021, as we were also gearing up to the COP26, we partnered again with ARP and others to develop the global roadmap for for healthcare decarbonization. As part of this project, we included uh, information on scopes one, two, and three, and developed fact sheets for 68 countries. It allowed us to visualize the emission hotspots in particular countries by bringing in data sets that looked at the bigger picture. This is the document that established that by meeting Paris Agreement commitments, we can reduce health sector emissions growth by 70%. And we did this by identifying also seven high impact actions across three key pathways. And along with different trajectories based on emissions um, from different countries, as well as income from different countries. Now, one of the questions in the Q&A talked about, should uh, le lesser developed countries be worrying about this? How do we make the case? Now, this is the case. Here it is, A, it's possible, two, it's important that when, as we grow in uh, lesser developed countries, because the healthcare systems need to continue to grow, we do so in a way that is continuously sustainable. And finally, that is of quality. I think you guys talked about this uh, earlier during Fiona's and during uh, James's speech, 
um, it's important that it's of quality, that it's effective, and that it reaches the, everyone in your country. So what were these seven pathways? And we wanted to talk about these seven. Now, you'll see that the first two really were talking about electricity, energy, and buildings. And this does not necessarily uh, contradict what the other speakers said. What happens is that this also is taking into consideration the fact that we have commitments on Paris Agreement around energy. And if we do so, not just towards the health sector, but throughout other areas of society and other areas of production, it is important just to look at that and how that would actually reduce emissions of the health sector. Not uh, to make them lesser, the sustainable uh, travel and transport is also very important. This uh, doesn't only apply to um, um, green ambulances, perhaps, but also around travel of staff, travel of patients, and the, probably the effect that telemedicine may take um, in different countries. Food is also another element that we looked at in this, um, in this area and how local sustainable and planned forward um, production can ensure a contribution to close to one gigaton um, of emissions. And this is equivalent to the emissions of two countries like France and Germany in one year. Pharmaceuticals were another area of, um, of concern and emissions in this area is it's a, the one area that is very specific to, to, health, to health interventions, the way medicines are prescribed, um, the way that they're manufactured and the ways that is generated from these products. Um, the next area is um, also important and it's around how waste is managed in, in, in how sustainable healthcare happens. Uh, not just in the uh, way that medical products could be redesigned for reuse, um, but also how we autoclave safely rather than in using incineration or how gloves may not be needed for every single intervention. And these are areas that hospitals around the world are taking a look at now. And finally, um, establish greater health systems effectiveness. And this has to deal not just with um, the, the the, the, the recognizable areas around quality, of course, but that and that we reach um, and, and are accessible in terms of health sector, but also um, how we address the right healthcare goals in every country. And this is especially an issue in high spend countries as well. But to learn about this process, we were trying to figure out how we can um, really look at a hybrid approach to monitor emissions. We had had years of experience working with our Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network, which is in, uh, I believe, over 80 countries. And it uh, encompasses thousands of health systems and health facilities around the world. Um, and look at the data from that bottom up. And at the same time, how the, the data from top down, looking at national data, na national spend data, national survey data, how those two areas can combine to create a GHG, a, G a greenhouse gas emissions estimate, um, and a way forward for a country to plan around um, a lower carbon sustainable healthcare system. So we embarked into a project that we call Operation Zero. And this was led in the first phase by our Europe office. The vision of this project is that every country in Europe commits, commits to delivering net zero healthcare through the development of a national decarbonization roadmap for its healthcare sector that charts a Paris compatible course to net zero emissions in all scopes. The objective was to develop this methodology that can be applied by any national or regional health authority to produce a healthcare carbon footprint and decarbonization roadmap. Now, this was done with three health systems in Europe, uh, the government of Netherlands, the government of Portugal, and the regional authority of Lazio in Italy. We published then this set of principles, which includes quite a bit of technical information on data sources, uh, pros and cons for decision making, um, and, um, and and the governments we work with have been developing their national work plans at the same time. Now the audience for this methodology can be twofold. The first one I would say is is particularly for analysts, people who really can delve into data sets, um, who have experience in working with greenhouse gas emissions. 
But there's a secondary audience as well around policy officials who will need to also engage with key stakeholders in different areas of government um, and also with the private sector like health suppliers, um, but also with health facility managers, uh, finance teams and practitioners who deliver healthcare to make sure that they're all on board around the plan. Um, if you see the, the document to your right, that is the Portugal um, National Plan of Action um, for Mitigation in the Healthcare Sector. It was uh, just published a few weeks ago, and um, it actually charts a course for reducing significantly their emissions to about 70% by the year 2050. We learned a lot during this, um, the putting together of this methodology. Um, it doesn't include just instructions for modeling, but it also helped us learn uh, the target trajectory for future emissions, like I said, in Portugal, um, and what kind of data and what kind of human resources is needed for this type of work in each of the countries. As part of our work, um, not just for country level data, but also from the bottom up, we developed um, the Climate Impact Checkup Tool. And I think that um, James talked about it a little bit earlier today in his presentation. Um, we first developed a version of this tool in 2016 in Latin America, and we launched it in 2021 with a global lens. It included not only uh, submissions for tests if somebody wanted to just try it out, it included also a, a steam purchase for scope two, which is particularly important for some of the Northern countries too but also a hotspots tool, which allowed us to um, look at scope three emissions from a spent and uh, expenditure data um, point of view. And as we were talking about this scope two, one, one, two, three, and some of the extra or the indirect supply chain um, of scope three, they, we use usually this graph um, I think it's really great that Beth was explaining how in Providence they also got to look at it from an acronym perspective. That's really good to get people like um, to buy in also into a particular project. Um, in the tool itself, we, we do use scopes one, two, three and supply chain indirect, um, but we are trying as much as possible to include emissions factors from countries where countries have that information, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as well as the expenditure data for the supply chain. And finally, I want to finish our, our case study by how we are applying this checkup tool at a national level. Um, so in 2022, we sign a memorandum of understanding with the Colombia Ministry of Health to facilitate the first country level project to estimate a national health system's carbon foot footprint. And for this, we use the climate impact checkup tool on a representative sample of health facilities in the country. Now, this was a representative sample. Uh, it included public and private facilities, a diversity of geographical regions and span, uh, levels of care. Um, it was complex. The idea here was to actually try to get a sample of about, I believe it was about 300 facilities we ended up uh, having a call and we ended up with about 500 facilities uh, wanting to join, which is great because we know also that in some cases you will lose some of those health facilities, unfortunately, through the process. Um, but we were also able to really fulfill our representation at this point, and we hope to keep it through the end of the, of the process of the project. Now, we'll be training this representative sample of the health institutions. Uh, but not only that, we will also provide a technical support for the health institutions that are part of the survey sample. We will do an analysis to estimate the system's carbon footprint um, with a baseline of 2021. And then finally, we will also put together some recommendations or help the government put some, together some recommendations for the development of the country's sectoral comprehensive plan for climate change management. This is an important uh, piece of uh, work. And thank you, Irene, I see you. I know I have three minutes um, and it's an important piece of work because it's uh, legislation by the government of Colombia that every sector, including the health sector, has a plan for climate change management. The timeline of the project is assessed, uh, will be all done by the end of this year with the project closing um, in quarter four. And we are at this point just finished the trainings in quarter one and we are doing the data gathering and footprint cafes will take place 
um, in June, where we sit with the health facilities. We'll sit in different places in Colombia in order to do virtual and face-to-face -face meetings um, to um, help them navigate the tool, if you will. The result analysis will be done in quarter three of this year. But in summary, I do want to talk about where we are with all of these, um, these different projects, right? Um, as James said early on, we are still learning. This is very much a new thing. Um, and we are learning about what the methodologies are telling us from the top down and from the bottom up. The footprint analysis is valuable in many, in many ways. It allows us not just to estimate and not just to plan, um, not just to see what are the biggest areas uh, of, of emissions, but as Beth said, to have your staff kind of rally around something that they care about, that they deeply care about, which is making sure that people are healthy and that we are making them healthy, that we're not just also fighting climate change in an advocacy way, but that we're also doing, acting. Um, it's important to note, somebody was, I think, in the Q&A section talking about pathways of care, and maybe there were particular areas of, of, of diseases or particular diseases that we should tackle, maybe. I think that it's important to also note that as a healthcare sector, we should also continue to look at prevention. And that's also important to note. There are many challenges, the aggregation and integration of data not being easy ones. Uh, there is no perfect one size fits all model. Every country is different, every health system is different, um, and they will have different uh, emissions uh, issues or emissions um, um, hotspots, if you will. Um, and then finally, that demand for um, support, for technical support, will continue to grow. It's not going to go down. And it's coming, and we'll see, we're seeing it already from many countries from the global south as well, not just from the global north. Um, and we are trying, attempting as much as possible between us and also other partners to be able to fulfill them. I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. And back to you, Irene. Muchísimas gracias, Diana. Qué interesante eh, tu caso. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. Your, your case is very interesting. Uh, we have many questions, but one can be addressed to every participant. Maybe Fiona, James, and Elizabeth, can you please turn on your cameras? Thank you. So whoever wants to go first, please raise your hand. I would like to know which treatments or diagnosis in hospitals uh, actually uh, generate more uh, emissions and also in primary care centers. Do our emissions related more to treatments and diagnosis or infrastructure? So I think that's an excellent question. So whoever wants to go, please raise your hand. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. In primary care, I mean, Primary care is an important source of, of uh, prescriptions, and so primary care may, is 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 very high, not so much in facilities, but in terms of medications, is a particular kind of hot spot. So appropriate uh, appropriateness, management, deprescribing, optimizing medications, um, and also where appropriate, and it can often be alternatives that are not um, pharmacological, social prescribing using strength-based approaches that engage communities and individuals as, as agents within their communities. These are, these are some of the strategies within primary care um, that are particularly important. Gracias, Fiona. Si alguien más quiere contestar esa pregunta. Thank you, Fiona. Anyone else who would like to answer this question or should we go on? It really largely depends. Um, I remember looking at data one time, um, and it was particular to Brazil at some point in areas of very rural areas, right, where people had to travel a long way to get to primary health care. Uh, that is also a potential. So it very much depends uh, in the context. Bien, muchas gracias. Esta pregunta para James. Thank you. Okay, this one uh, uh, addresses James. Uh, low and middle income countries, they do not contribute emissions so much. How can we persuade large countries to reduce their emissions? Thank you. If I understand the question, it's the, the countries of the South uh, 
the low and middle income countries, the SIDS, contribute very little of greenhouse gases. So how can we make the, or help get the big countries that are really emitting greenhouse gas to change? Is that the question? So I have two parts to my answer. I don't like the position that, oh, we contribute so little, uh, we don't have to change. Because there are so many positive co-benefits to health from mitigation. So I want to be a mitigation champion, even as we have to adapt, and even as we have to pressure the, the bigger countries to change, we also have to change. And I think if you're going to the negotiations table on anything, if you are doing something towards the problem, you're in a stronger position. As if we are doing everything to decarbonize our health sector or our country. Or Now, having said that, you're right. There is a huge disparity in scale. And the, the real action for the world as a whole is the big countries. But, but I don't let us off the hook. The Caribbean has 50 million tourists a year at two to three tons of carbon per tourist. We are part of the problem. We have to be part of the solution as well. Trinidad and Tobago has a 25 to 26 tons per person per year carbon footprint. You know why? Because we produce and export our carbon and Guyana is now exporting its carbon. So we are a little bit hypocritical when we say, oh, the problem is in the North, not us. Not Somebody else must act, not us. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit fired up. I don't buy that. We have to act as well. And the rationale for acting is that we get good health benefits from climate mitigation. Uh, we, we can, et cetera, as we've been saying elsewhere in, in this series. Um, how to get the big countries. We need something that has not been done before. I don't know, except the doctors of the world in a way stop the world for COVID. I don't know how you can translate. We need a massive upheaval. We need citizens to take hold of this thing because it is our children and grandchildren that are at stake. And I mean, create a citizen-wide movement, one billion tech signatures or something like this, or a citizen's assembly. The UN COP system is not working for us. It is not working for us. It's a straight line in carbon dioxide emissions and the number of the COP, if you want to be spurious in your statistics. So uh, somebody is pointing out an opportunity to educate 50 million visitors. You're right. Uh, 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 and, and that is the reality. We, they're not going to stop coming. We're not going to stop being dependent on tourism. But we've got to look at how we get how we get tourists. Where I'm staying is an air-conditioned palace. I cannot imagine the carbon footprint of this thing. There's, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And the hotel and tourism industry knows this. Uh, and I think they're also trying uh, to make changes uh, so I'll, I think yeah, we need to agitate and make noise in the rest of the world like we never did before, like we never did before, and, and through the UN, but also through alternative mechanisms, because the UN is polluted with the fossil fuel, uh, 1,000 representatives in the last COP. You wouldn't put the tobacco industry in, in, in a, 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 a plan for reducing uh, lung cancer in the world. You, you wouldn't. So we have huge conflict of industry at global level, and it's affecting all of us. I, I will <laughs> stop. <laughs> Gracias, James. Me gusta que, eh, me gusta que Thank you, James. Uh, I, I like you to be thought-provoking, you know. Uh, but we're now close to the end. I would like to uh, give Beth an opportunity to answer this question. Beth. They're asking a difficult question that you might ask, uh, answer it briefly. We need to reduce, for instance, mortality and morbidity uh, on account of diabetes, because diabetes increases carbon footprints. Uh, do you agree with this statement? All chronic diseases are uh, contributing to our res resource use. You know, one of the things of the principles of sustainability, the first one is to go way upstream and create better health in the first place. So we decrease the utilization of high end, high intensively uh, resource intensive services like hospitalization. So, so yes, I would say that's the case for really many, many aspects of health. And, and diabetes is um, not unique, I wouldn't say. Some aspects of diabetes are probably driven by our unhealthy lifestyles, but not all. And so I think we'd want to be careful with 
identifying you know, a culprit disease or anything like that, but certainly to go upstream and do what we can to help, um, as James was saying, the co-benefits of doing all this work also helps drive down our disease load. Really important part of, of changing, transforming our, our attitude approach and uh, thinking about resource use in healthcare. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Beth. Gracias a todos. Gracias Thank a you so much, Beth. Thank you, the participants. Thank you to our speakers. It has been a truly wonderful session. We are truly honored to have welcomed you today. And we'll see you again, all the participants, on Thursday. Thank you, Diana, Fiona, Beth, and James. Thank you so much. Thank you.